Welcome back to <laughs> Cookie Pocket. This podcast is about film. Uh, this is episode 50-something. I, I, I can't really remember. I've lost track Three. of myself. Um, it could Three. be episode 53, but it could also not be. We're recording some of these out of order, so I think some of us have lost track. Uh, but maybe Mitchell hasn't. I don't know. It's an episode. I, I, I have um, no idea. And we're, we're hedging we're, our number bets today. We're kind of we're kind of winding down season two. Uh, last time was Uh-oh. Christian's last episode of the season, and this time it is my last episode of the season. And I so, don't get like an episode I said last time. Uh, <laughs> I decided to bring out the big guns, and we are talking about nominally my favorite movie of all time. Technically, I have three favorite movies of all time, but this is the one that I put at the top of the pyramid. When people ask me what's your favorite movie, I say. Cool Hand Luke, uh, directed by Stuart Rosenberg, 1967, starring Paul Newman and George Kennedy. It's got a pretty simple plot. plot. Uh, Paul Newman plays uh, Luke, who one night is arrested for cutting the heads off of parking meters and is sentenced to two years on a Florida chain gang, uh, where he refuses to conform with the rules of the prison and the gang. Uh, and we kind of just get to see Luke's various attempts at escape and him getting along with the other people in the camp. And I think it's intensely charismatic and really interesting and entertaining. Um, But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Overall thoughts, what did you guys think of Cool Hand Luke? Well, as Zach would say when he starts this part when he's not the host, well, um, I gave this a 4 out of 5, and I liked it very, very much. Um, This uh, was kind of a similar viewing experience for me as another Paul Newman picture we've seen together, The Sting, in that it took me a little while t- to settle into it. And um, it-, it being an, an older and, and just, you know, it's it's aware of its own pace. But it is it is a bit of a slog for, for those with, with less of an attention span than Zach Gergis, which I think is, is most people. But um, I did like it quite a bit. And there are, there are several moments in this that are akin to that one moment in The Sting where I was like, oh my gosh, it's amazing. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I, and I think f- film is a collection of moments and if moments stick out to you, it, it, I think it succeeds. Um, Paul Newman is obviously, or at least in my opinion, without parallel, I can't imagine anyone, uh, doing this film and this character justice the same way he does. I think he's outstanding and yeah, I, I love the, uh, I love the futility of it. I really like the ending. And I, I'd like to revisit it again someday, and maybe I'd even give it a higher number then. But for now, uh, four out of five, great film. Okay. Go in your kitchen right now. Open up the cupboard. <laughs> there he is. The salad dressing. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> That's what how was... iconic he is. He lives in your house, and you didn't even know. <laughs> Paul Newman, OG Chad. <laughs> every time he every time he's doing anything, I want to hear what he's going to say. Because yeah. whatever he says is like, like infinite brain. Like I can't even, I can't even comprehend it. It's, it's so, it's so crazy how, how, how awesome he is and uh, how stoic he is and everything. And I heavily identify with his philosophy, but like, yeah. <laughs> and that's it. And that's him, the entire movie. And um, even when he gets shot and yeah. he's not only like, like neutral but he's even content and he's and it's like that little sliver of contentness as they harp on at the very end um that really that really carries it home um also kennedy's performance is also very uh, a good not really a counter but a compliment to uh newman's uh acting and um just him being so bombastic and being like so in the moment and kind of disc- almost like pseudo exposition when he's trying to you know say what's going on and trying to do the next thing and it it serves really well with newman's character um and that's like the like that's like my favorite thing about the whole film um i gave it a four and a half out of five um i think the cinematography is pretty darn good Mm -hmm. i think there's a lot of really memorable close-ups with when they're using tools and when there's you know uh individual character moments and i think that really helps you know harp on the anti uh establishment uh themes going on Um, and the other thing is the anti, anti anti-establishment themes are also very prevalent. Um, and I think that they're so highly universally applicable. You can pretty much use it uh, to, you know, as an allegory for anything. And I think that's a great thing. Um, obviously it's, it's probably an anti-Vietnam thing at the time, but, um, and there's an air of sixties-ness 
um, and a little bit too bit too like I, I agree with Christian a little bit slow going in the beginning maybe after a second watch you can appreciate a lot more just by knowing what's going to happen because I uh, you know I was kind of it's kind of just felt like it was going from scene to scene trying to to build the characters and that's about it but if you don't really know what the characters are there for it kind of hurts a little bit um, but that pretty much gets remedied relatively quickly i mean like within like 40 minutes which i would say is is, is quickly <laughs> i don't know when it comes to slow burner yeah. movies but um but yeah four and a half out of five really not a lot to criticize um definitely a big a big um a big influence i would say um on a lot of prison dramas and i think it's it has a lot of really memorable moments and it's iconic for a reason so Last time, Christian referred to La La Land as as a film that really sort of uh, sparked his interest in film beyond simply kind of an observational, like, yeah, movie's a movie t type thing. I, I would say that for me, Cool Hand Luke is sort of the film that did that. Uh, I have a real attachment to this movie. Um, I, I watched older films when I was young quite a bit, including like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and The Sting. Uh, but this is kind of one of the first or older films that I saw and was really drawn into and really formed an attachment with. Um, and this sounds incredibly egotistical, but I do think it's sort of because I felt some sort of connection to the character of Luke. Uh, when I was a kid, I moved around a lot, so I was very used to the idea of kind of coming into a situation where there's a status quo and rules and regulations and expectations and just kind of deciding to do your own thing uh, and, and see if maybe you mesh into those at some point. So, I mean, at the time, I didn't think, like, oh, well, I'm Luke or anything like that. I, I just kind of <laughs> enjoyed it. Uh, but looking back on it, I think I may have enjoyed it for that reason. But, yeah, I think that Newman is incredibly charismatic in this, as he is in everything, unless we're talking about Alfred Hitchcock's Torn Curtain, in which case, what were you doing, Hitch? Um, but, but in this, he's great. He's, he's the epitome of cool. He's so charismatic. Uh, but I also agree that George Kennedy is great. I think that Stu Stuart Rosenberg's direction is just incredible. This movie is framed beautifully. Every single shot seems so deliberate and so thought out in terms of shape and depth and dimension and color. Uh, Conrad Hall's cinematography is just fantastic. I every time I watch this movie, I find more to like about it, uh, which, which I'm glad of because I hadn't seen this for a while. So on this rewatch, I was worried it was going to go down for me. But if anything, it, it went up in, my, uh, in, my, in its regard. Uh, for me. So it's it's a five out of five. It's one of my favorite movies. Um, and I would say it's one of the greatest pieces of American cinema uh, ever made, um, which you guys may agree with. You may not. That's the place it holds for me at the very least. Um, now, you guys didn't mention this, so I am intrigued to talk about this. This movie features a lot of religious themes and imagery. Uh, there are scenes like when uh, Luke eats the 50 eggs. Afterwards, he's seen lying on the table in the pose of Jesus on the, on the cross. At the end of the film, his image is superimposed over the cross made by the roadway. Uh, things like Dragline speaking to him in the orchard, similar to Jesus speaking to his disciples in the orchard on the night before his death. So I'm, I'm just interested in, in discussing, did you guys notice those religious themes and symbols? And if so, did they add or take away from the plot for you? Well, I'll be the first to admit I did not um, at all, or at least not none of the ones that you cited. Um, but I don't, th I don't think it bothers me or enhances the experience too much. I, I think I could I could take it or leave it. But um, I I think more in the terms that that Mitchell laid in his opening uh, comments, and that the film at large is kind of a, a broader allegory for anti establishment and and i think that's you know widely applicable and and intentionally so so i mean no i did not notice uh those those symbols that you cited but um i think it it makes sense uh that that luke may be perceived as some sort of savior to to his to his cohorts because he's willing to to at least challenge uh the rules that are in place but I suppose it's it's artful and clever to to include some of those moments, but I I personally did not notice them in, in my first viewing. Mm -hmm. I definitely I definitely picked up on it, and and the when he's laying uh, out looking like Jesus, I think that was like this is definitely going to be like a recurring theme, um, <laughs> and I was looking out for it after that. But I thought uh, I thought it added to it. 
Um, I think I think a problem that some movies might have is that they kind of maybe a little bit with the Knights configuration is that it kind of defines it kind of defines itself on or considering the the Christian aspect as if it needs to be harped on in some bombastic or exaggerated way. Uh, I feel like considering the time period and considering the setting, I think you can really do a lot. You really have a lot of flexibility with considering uh, Christianity and uh, portraying it as another element. Um, I think it also, like Christian said, I think it pretty much feeds into the anti-establishment thing. Um, I don't think it's necessarily outwardly suggesting that, like, you know, it, 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 like the, that authorities are automatically not Christian, but that know. there are aspects of of uh, of bad authority or bad or, or, or of author of of many aspects of authoritarianism that are uh, anti-Christian. Um, and it's up to you to decide, you know, it's kind of just planting the seed for you to decide how much that influences it. And I really like that. I don't think, I think it's subtle enough and I think it's, it, it makes sense in the setting enough where it doesn't feel like it's forced at all. And I think it just is another, it adds, just adds another layer to, to the, uh, to the themes and the messages. And I think, I think that's fine. Yeah. I think that it, it, a lot of the time, like you said, when, when Christian themes or imagery are included in a film, it's tempting, I think, for filmmakers to make the whole movie about that. And yeah. I don't think this movie is about Christianity, re really, at all. It contains Christian themes, uh, or it contains Christian images or religious imagery. Um, but that, that's, that's pretty standard for fiction, just because religion is such a common thing amongst human beings. So I think mm -hmm. it adds some sort of universal universality to the, uh, to the plot. Um, I don't think this is a movie that's meant to, like convert people to Christianity or anything like that. Yeah, I think it's yeah. just adding, for me at least, it adds a cer it adds to a certain extent to almost the futility of it. Um, because once you've kind of picked up on those elements and you recognize that, at least symbolically, Luke is kind of the Jesus of this story, you kind of start to feel that this is, this can't be headed anywhere but downhill for the character. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I also think it adds a ton to that final scene, uh, or I guess climactic scene, where Luke is in the church and is is kind of sarcastically talking to God, um, I, I think it lends a lot of uh, kind of introspective weight to that scene, um, which I think works without that. I think the entire movie works without the the religious themes if you don't pick up on yeah. them, like Christian was saying. But I do think if you notice, like, okay, Luke is the Jesus here. Something is going to happen to him. He's going to have to make some kind of sacrifice in some way to fit with these themes. I think it adds in your head to the, this can't be for anything other than rebellion, and it can't be for anything other than non-conformity. I don't think we're hitting the happiness here. And I, I think that really, really works. At least specifically for me, on this viewing, it really worked. Um, and I think it also helps to... I, I think it adds to certain character motivations as well. I think if you recognize that Dragnet is kind of a... Uh, a drag line, rather. If you, if you recognize that his character is kind of a combination of, like... Judas and Paul, in a way, thinking of religious characters. Um, I think it, it, it really does add something to his character and what you get out of his character, particularly when he rushes into the church uh, after clearly betraying uh, Luke because he got frightened. Um, but actually, I'm, I'm bringing up actors, so, so let's, let's talk about the performances in this movie. Uh, to a certain extent, I think this is an actor's movie, uh, George Kennedy and, and, and Paul Newman are in this, like we've mentioned, but we've also got Strother Martin as the prison captain, uh, who also appeared in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid as the, um, the old prospector. Um, <laughs> we've got uh, Harry Dean Stanton in a small role, uh, Dennis Hopper uh, in another role. Uh, there's, there's, there's all kind of later character actors who would rise to greater prominence in this. So what did you guys think of the performances throughout this film, uh, specifically Newman and Kennedy? Uh, Kennedy having won uh, the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for this movie. Um, but, you know, feel free to talk about any, any actors if you'd like. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. That's a new piece of information that, that frightens me to say this. I thought Kennedy was, like, fine. I didn't think he was, like, exceptional. I thought he was, he was fine for the role, but I I did not... I would not put him on the same, like... Uh, I, I guess, as Mitchell might say, Giga Chad tier as as Paul Newman, <laughs> um, but he's he's fine. I don't I don't mean to sound critical. I, I, at some point, at some point, what I'm even trying to say here is pedantic because obviously he's very good. Um, I, I enjoyed our guy, Harvey Dean Stanton, 
from Alien and and what is it? The Escape from New York? Is that he's, yeah, he's in that, yeah. Yeah. I enjoyed his guitar playing. Um and this is also kind of a non answer, but I think the ensemble of of uh of inmates, just that group and, and the dynamic that that group carries is is uh is very central and important. Like if I think of performances i think paul newman and then i think like all the other men and that's not to say that they're not um individuals or that they don't each bring a good performance but as an ensemble i think they work really really well and there's there's a clear chemistry between them and um there's uh over the course of the film there's a reflected admiration and and almost like distant pity for for luke and i think that that group dynamic works really well which is which can be hard when when you've got a bunch of actors or, or character actors who want who want to assert like really particular uh, personalities. And for me, that didn't take away from the group at all. So, yeah, mm-hmm. kudos yeah. to the other inmates. Yeah, I think Dragline kind of just represents the the most being like, I'm your biggest fan. Please sign. Please sign my uh, please autograph this picture of you with two girls. Um, and I think that's. <laughs> That's pretty much his character, and I think, I guess it helps to have, yeah, I would say it helps to have, like, one character represent all of that, especially when he can pull off having such a, 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 a big emotional range. Um, he can be, like, overly excited fairly quickly, where it doesn't come off as being unnatural, um, and I also think that uh, Paul Newman, obviously, being so, like, he's he doesn't feel like you know, good, bad, the ugly, kind of like you, st- all the stares and looking around. It's like a natural, like you want to see what he wants to, what he's going to say. You know, he's an interesting person, and a lot of what he does is more defined by his actions rather than his words, um, which I feel like a lot of films struggle with. They feel like they have to be big action heroes and also have really good dialogue. Um, and not to say there isn't good dialogue, of course there is, but it's just, it's so, there's so little of it and it's such of high quality that it doesn't feel like he's trying to be a messiah or something, or he's trying to be like bigger than everyone else. He just is bigger than everyone else. Um, and that's, you know, one of the best aspects of his character, but, um, Morgan Woodward, uh, big, <laughs> big boy walking around. He, he was, he didn't have to do anything at all. Oh, Carl the um, floor walker or no, no man with no eyes. Yeah. Man with no eyes, yeah. Um, he he was he was pretty he was pretty sick, and I like the um, the reflective glasses aspect of him. I know it feel it feels a little like it's just he's trying to make him a villain, but um, he's definitely like a walking symbol of of authoritarianism and just no concern over anything at all besides what needs to be done, um, and just not saying anything at all. Um, and just being completely ruthless and it's hard to kind of have like a fully like hundred percent just, you know, doing nothing except just being like a walking robot character amongst all of these charismatic people, including all of the other inmates who also are, are pretty good uh, performers as well. But, um, I think it totally works. And I think just having that contrast against Newman's character is just, it works, it works awesome. Um, and then just, you know, seeing the inmates react and, and holding him to a higher standard as this like, you know, mystical guy that like just will insta insta kill you if you try to do anything, um, and I think that totally works with the themes. So, yeah, I'm I'm reminded that I didn't mention that this this was nominated for four Academy Awards. Um, Newman was nominated for Best Actor. Uh, Kennedy was nominated for Best Supporting and and won. Uh, and then it was also nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay and Best Original Score, uh, which I really love the score in this. Uh, it's subtle though it is. Um, but yeah, I, I think Newman is great in this movie, but I do think to a certain extent, he's kind of just playing himself. Uh, it's, it's Mm -hmm. very clear. Paul Newman is kind of the ultimate cool. He's Paul Newman in a lot of different films that he's cast in. He can give a great performance, but in a lot of movies he's cast to be Paul Newman and to bring that charisma and that reputation with him. Um, so I can understand him not winning best actor. Uh, I think... I think you can understand George Kennedy's win a bit more if you think of it within the context of the time. Uh, George Kennedy, before this movie, was primarily known as a guy who just played, like, villains and heavies on, like, TV and in B-movies. Um, and for him to go from that to a character like this, where I would say he has, like, the, the biggest arc in the movie, um, from, you know, essentially the... kind of the secondary villain of the piece at the beginning 
to uh, at the end, he's he's basically become the prophet of Luke. I mean, he wears the chains that that Luke once yeah. wore and kind of s- spreads the word of Luke amongst the other prisoners, which I I think is kind of a beautiful ending. And I think he he sells it with very little dialogue and only a couple facial expressions. Um, and when he when he charges the man with no eyes at the end and is saying, "Oh, yeah. I got some world shaking to do," like that, that really gets to me. I I kind of I kind of choke up at that moment. Send I think a postcard. Really <laughs> yeah, it, it would almost be like um, it would almost be like if if like David Harbor or John Cena played this kind of a role nowadays. Oh my! Oh like, god! Like if, oh. like somebody like that who's primarily known for just like they're fun, but they're like they're kind of just like muscle man, like giving a really emotive performance with a big Dave arc. Bautista in Blade Runner. Sure, yeah, Dave yeah. Bautista in Blade Runner. Like, I, I feel like people in 30 years are probably going to look back on that role and go, like, he's fine. But for people who kind of know where he started and, and where he ends up in that movie, it's, like, a big deal. Uh, even though I don't believe he was really nominated for anything for that character. Um, but, yeah, I, I think all the actors in this movie do a spectacular job. Uh, and I like how everybody has a certain amount of depth to them. Um, even the characters who seem kind of the flattest have some kind of little tick to them. Uh, the captain, um, in the moments like the, the notorious, uh, what we got here is a failure to communicate, uh, moment yeah. when he, when he hits Luke and he rolls down the hill, you can see that the captain has these like deep insecurities about like his own perceived authority over these men and, and whether he actually thinks of himself as an authority over them. And it's not like it's a fleshed out thing, but you get that through the performance um, the man with no eyes, he seems like such a flat, walled-off character, but in the way that he's shot, and the way that he moves, and specifically at the end, when he's tackled and he's just kind of scrabbling around in the mud, desperately trying to find his glasses, you see yeah. some depth from him as well. Uh, and I think Harry Dean Stanton as well, uh, I, I think, I guess you could almost call him like a sort of Greek chorus for certain scenes, because <laughs> it's almost, he's like a constant present throughout like the second act of this movie, where he's playing songs in the background, playing guitar, and singing to accompany specific scenes and add to the tonality of those moments, which I think is just great. Um, I I really do. I think everybody shines in this movie. Carl the Floor Walker even even shines in, like, the egg scene where it's yeah. you don't really recognize him but like he's there taking bets as well like everybody's invested and everybody's <laughs> acting in every moment and I, I I just love that. Um yeah. So let's okay. Christian, at the very beginning, you mentioned the end of the movie, so I do want to go get back to the end. Uh, final question before we go on to final thoughts, uh, despite the fact that I, if I could, I would talk about this movie all day. Uh, th- yeah, he's dead. What did we Morgan think of, of, of that ending? Uh, at the end of the movie, Luke oh. goes on the run for one final time. Uh, spoilers if you haven't seen Cool Hand Luke, but we spoil right. everything, so you should be used to this. Um, Luke <laughs> goes on the run for one last time. Uh, he uh-huh. leaves Dragline in an orchard. Uh, he briefly goes into a church and kind of sarcastically talks to God. Dragline, it turns out, got the cops, and Luke is shot and dies on the way to the hospital. Uh, so what do we think of that ending, and do we think it fits with the rest of the film? Hmm. I think it's interesting that you said he sarcastically talks to God, because I think that that may be my favorite moment in, in the movie, actually. And mm. um, there's definitely you definitely get that sly, like... Paul Newman is is being the cool guy uh, vibe there in that scene, but I think he I think he's kind of like I'm at the end of my rope, so I'm going to reach out, even though I know you're not there. But the just the oh, the fact alone that he's having that conversation means that he's like at least a little bit to me. I think it's more than just than just like an, an inner monologue because he's sitting in a church and he's he's looking up and he's speaking out loud. I think that alone means there's there's a little bit more going on than just uh, total futility or or uh, disbelief in in divinity or or whatever. But um, I, I love the ending. I I um I think it's terrific that he that he gets shot. I know that sounds yeah. very wrong, but um, I cannot imagine it being a more satisfying uh, conclusion, especially just. I think it really hammers home everything the movie's trying to say for, for the rest of the runtime. So yeah, I yep. think it's great. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that the film not really having an end and not really having like a conclusion or like a reason or him having a drive besides 
being independent and just being, you know, an egomaniac, just being like, I'm just doing whatever I want to do. And that's why I want to do what I want to do. And um, which kind of reflects, you know, of the time period, because a lot of people at that time were not really politically motivated against certain things. People were a lot more, you know, like, I just want to get high and, and you know, and, and do promiscuous things without the law coming after me. And Sad. that's and, and it's a lot. It was a lot more personal. Um, and, and people in general, I would say, uh, in America, were a lot more. Uh, personal and individualized before things started to get a lot more politically divided. Um, and I think that really is uh, timeless. I think that works all the time because there's always people that want to do things that don't really have an end. And even if you don't want an end to, to the actual thing, you can just make up anything. You can make up why was he really trying to do what he was trying to do. Um, even though, you know, he was talking in the church and it sounded like he was, he was at the, you know, the end of his road and, you know, it was pretty much the end of him. I mean, he didn't really care. He just knew that he was going to keep rejecting authority no matter what. And if you have an interesting character that has a drive to do something without having an actual goal or, or like an actual fully planned out thing, which Kennedy's character kind of, you know, drag a line pretty much lays out like this is what we should do in this. And he's like, none of it matters. Like, I'm just going to keep doing the same thing. Just rejecting authority is all I'm about. And it's, you know, rebel without a cause. And I think that's I think that's awesome, and I think it completely plays through at the very end. Um, and you don't need to really know anything else. So I think it works great. Yeah, I think touching on the conversation with God, Christian, I, I do think when I I would say I think it's a sarcastic conversation with God, but I think that sarcasm is almost a uh, defense mechanism is the wrong yeah. word, but it's it's like a, it, it's it's a sheen over it sure. i think he, sure. he's he's talking to god with a, a tone of sarcasm and a thought of sarcasm but i do believe there's some sort of hope in him that there's something there and i think that's particularly ram tone he like he ends his initial kind of thoughts with uh maybe i'm just a hard case uh and then the police show up and he looks back up once again one more time and says well looks like you're a hard case too and i think that final moment really does indicate that he feels he's talking to something um because i feel if if he was just doing that as a joke, you know, if he felt he wasn't talking anything. He, I don't feel like he would do that, because it's not like yeah. he has to maintain a joke with himself or anything. I feel like he would just walk on and ignore it, but that line to me indicates that there's more hope there than I think even he might be aware of. Um, in terms of the actual ending with Luke dying, I I think it's, it's, it's just beautiful. Um, and I, I think... A large part of that to me is that I'm I'm a fan of endings that maybe aren't necessarily entirely happy, but leave some thought and are, are kind of ambiguous. And I think that this is to a certain extent ambiguous. Um, I mentioned before we recorded today that um, my sister, uh, her reaction to this film at the end of the movie. Uh, I watched this a couple years ago. I rewatched it and I watched it with my family. And at the end of the film, my sister said. So they were just in jail, and he died? What was the point? Um, and, and for me, I feel that the point is, is that at the end, he doesn't just die. He prevents the system from winning. Uh, Luke is in a system where he can't possibly win, but he doesn't have to lose. Um, and, and so his final act of this movie is sort of like a final screw you to the system that he's in. Uh, and in, in a bizarre kind of way, he, he prevents them from winning, and he, and he dies with a smile on his face. Um, and on the way to the hospital, that, that traffic light changes from, uh, from green to red, uh, yeah. which always, yeah. I think that's, oh, man, that, that always sends a, a pang through my closed and cold heart. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think it's an absolutely beautiful ending. I think it ties all the themes in the movie together brilliantly. And I think, you know, when, I, I think a lot of the time, um, you want Paul Newman to win. You want Paul Newman to ride off into the sunset with uh, with George Kennedy and, and go get a couple of farm girls or, or whatever Dragline wants to do. But at the end of the day, I think there's really no other way that a film like this could end. Uh, it ends on that bittersweet, minor thematic victory, uh, and the story goes on. And I, I think that's just perfect. Um, but all right, final thoughts then on Cool Hand Luke before I talk for three hours. <laughs> He's cool, he's got a hand, and his name is Luke. 
and he's pretty uh pretty cash money um definitely a good first time paul newman experience for anybody who has never been blessed with paul newman before um and i think uh i think there's just a lot of really good performances i think you should really just spend time to soak it in and kind of pick up on the underlying themes um and try to just uh you know have fun with it try to decipher what's going on um don't focus so much on the surface level stuff kind of pay attention to the dialogue pay attention to the character movements and try to get as much out of it as you think the director is trying to get give you and i think um you know just just it, it's not it's it's it, it doesn't have to be a big think like you can just be like ha prison people funny um paul newman dead very sad um but i mean it's really not meant for that it's definitely more of a think thinker and i think i think there's a lot of value to it um and i know there's a lot of people that like prison dramas and this is definitely definitely up there like i've seen maybe like six or seven this is like one of the best ones probably yeah, it's it's obviously great. Um, I think another reason I'm really drawn to the scene um, when when he's sitting in the church and sort of vaguely speaking to God, I think that's kind of our only moment where he, in my opinion at least, uh, I think tacitly takes some responsibility for his actions because it's very much um, sort of a, a subscript to whenever a fictional character like talks to God um, it's when they it's when they need something, which obviously applies, or or and it's when they need forgiveness, and um, and when when he does say that God is kind of like a hard case like him, I think there's a lack of surprise and maybe in in that uh, lack of surprise some some level of acceptance and realization that um, he's maybe a little bit at fault for the situation he's in. I'm not, I'm not a, obviously that's not the overarching theme is anti-establishment and, and it's, it's successfully conveyed, but I do like uh, that moment giving us just a little bit more of, uh, of Luke's uh, thought processes and just uh, maybe like the, the slightest twinge of responsibility for him. I think, I think makes the rest of the movie work better, but um, yeah, four out of five, um, uh, like Mitchell said, give it your attention because uh, you need to. <laughs> but um, yeah, I would I would recommend it. Unless your brother is trying to make you suffer through things that he likes. <laughs> you you you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that Luke throughout the film, I, I don't think he ever really blames his actions on others, but there is a sense that he doesn't really want to think about them being his own responsibility. Whenever he's kind of asked about, like, you, you were cutting off the heads off parking meters? Like, why, why were you doing that? Like, or, or anything like that. His answer yeah. is typically like, well, you know, just trying to find something to do. Um, and he just kind of brushes it off like that. And I do think yep. that um, that scene in the church is kind of one of the few moments where he sort of lets his cool down and lets his guard down and kind of just has an open moment of, I'm tired and I don't know what to do. Uh, so I do think it's a very open, important scene. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the score before we go. I think I've established that I love this movie. It's one of my absolute favorites. I think kind of the, the central theme of this movie on very quiet kind of uh, guitar, maybe banjo. I'm, I'm not positive. I'm not totally a music man. But that, that really gets to me. It, it, it has a little twinge in my heart feathers or whatever the the, the term is. Um, but that that's kind of very sad and kind of melancholy in a way that gets to me. Um, but the, the score in the tar paving scene... Um, is I think it's so rousing and effective, so rousing and effective, in fact, that it was used by the ABC Nightly News as the theme for their news roundup segment for like 50 <laughs> years. Um, so there's some legacy. I thought that's what that right was. Yeah. There's some legacy for this movie right off. And also the scene where uh, Luke plays Plastic Jesus on the banjo after he learns that his mother has died um, never fails to get to me i absolutely love that scene i love how it's done like specifically in one shot throughout the entirety of it and paul newman is like totally still from the majority of it until the very last verse uh beautiful music throughout so lovely movie please 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 check it out um but i'm gonna muzzle myself and we're gonna move on to the week in review uh, this is a new segment we've introduced for season two, where we talk about media we've consumed since the last episode. So what have you guys been watching? 
I moseyed on down to my local movie theater and I <laughs> I saw a film called Free Guy <laughs> starring Ryan oh, Reynolds. Oh lord. Yeah, um and directed by what's his face? I'm trying to pull up the letterbox, but the guy who directed Night at the Museum. Um uh Sean Levi Levy, one of the other, <laughs> Levi <so>. Pants. <laughs> yeah. Um anyway, I had relatively low expectations for this. I was kind of <laughs> thinking it would be more of a Paul Blart type deal where i'd give it a two but really like it or at least have fun not thinking about a movie while i watched it um and i really really liked it like i thought for a long time i very nearly gave this a four i landed on a 3.5 and uh it's got a lot of heart um i think it's the funniest movie i've seen in a long time i probably liked the suicide squad more but this was definitely funnier um yeah, just everyone is great in it. Taika plays this uh, this villain, and I was worried I, I'd be sick of Taika, but um, he's he's pretty good. And um, for for those Netflix Stranger Things fans out there, Joe Keery's in this and is very good. And uh, Jody Cummer, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, pl- who plays Ray's mother, it, very briefly in The Rise Whoa. of Skywalker. Oh, move on. <laughs> is, is also very very good in this, and it, it's got a lot of like dramatic and it's not dramatic but like there are moments where they really grapple with kind of big existential questions because some of the characters are literally just video game characters and they find out that they're fake and it's and then they have to grapple with like what gives their existence their relative existence meaning and it's really interesting and kind of very affecting at least for me so i gave it a 3.5 and i think it's a it's a blast it's just it's very fun but it's also got some good moments. It gets maybe a little bit too full of itself in the final act, but uh, it's a lot of fun. So, yeah. Go see hmm. it. Well, okay. <laughs> Ryan Reynolds. You know who's yes. not Ryan Reynolds? Clint Eastwood. You know who Clint Eastwood is oh. like? Nobody else. That is true. Uh, He's not Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> and I've been told that Dirty Harry, Dirty Harry is a movie that would appeal to my personality and that perhaps that was going to be the case and that ended up indeed being the case yeah. <laughs> um, um uh i this is definitely one of clint eastwood's best roles um i think he really comes out and really just gives every single line of dialogue his absolute best um the, the just when we're talking about chads i mean paul newman's one kind of chad but this is like the other kind like this dude just does not he just doesn't care. He don't care about the law. This is like one of the best they don't, I don't care about the law movies um, when it comes to like, I, I don't know, like crime thrillers. And um, this is definitely one of the best. Uh, definitely. I would say it's probably the best 70s crime thriller. Um, I think it really just it, it captured Scorpio's um, actor. I forget his name. Al Robinson, Pacino. I think. No, not Al Pacino. Um, oh, uh, wait, sorry. Wait, 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 yeah, wait, I was wait, thinking wait, about wait. a different Andrew thing. Robinson. Andrew Serpico. Robinson. Andrew Robinson's character is based off of uh, the Zodiac Killer. Mm -hmm. Um, And just having this crazy, like, San Francisco dark lighting and raininess and the the whole aesthetic and the dead silent moments are really good uh, with the dialogue and just the shooting back and forth feels so natural. Um, Scorpio seems like a total, like, you know, like a one-off, like, once a year you'll have this really sadistic dude that, like, doesn't really, like, kill a lot of people, but he, like, does really terrible things in between and to a few people and kills them and that is like a very realistic villain um and he just and and you think he's gonna keep getting caught and he just does not get caught and it's just the suspense with that is so realistic and he does such a he he is the best limping actor i've seen in a very long time all right that man can limp for miles and it's totally believable um but anyway uh, Clint Eastwood is awesome. Um, any Clint Eastwood fan, this is pretty much a staple. Um, any crime thriller fan, that definitely a staple. I feel like there's uh, like a very select few dull moments for me. Um, I feel like you kind of start to get the sense that this is like Clint Eastwood just being himself, and then you know it's kind of shooty shooty, and then the next th- scene happens just for a little bit. But really, the final act really just wraps it up so well, and I think it's an awesome actiony crime thriller and i think it really really pulls off what it's going for very well so i gave it a 4.5 out of 5 yeah 
Dirty Harry is great. And actually, speaking of Ryan Reynolds, before there was Deadpool, there was the Deadpool, the fourth Dirty Harry movie. So uh, I, I recommend checking <laughs> yes. out the sequels as well if you haven't seen those. Um, yep. But yeah, I, I watched something a bit different. Um, literally right before we recorded today, I watched the movie Villains from 2019, which I don't think a lot of people saw. Um, but essentially, it's a film. It stars Bill Skarsgård and Micah Monroe uh, as these two young lovers, kind of like a wannabe Bonnie and Clyde, but they're not as sadistic or, or nearly as efficient, um, who want to move down to Florida. So they rob a gas station, and then their car breaks down. So they have to break into a house and try to find the keys to a car, and then the, the couple that owns the house come home, and it turns out that they're a lot weirder and more sadistic uh, than the central couple of the film. So it's essentially kind of a bottle film that all takes place in this one house with the very upright aristocratic family that own, or aristocratic couple that owns it holding Bill and Micah hostage. Uh, and I really enjoyed it. Um, I've talked about a few films on Weekend Review that... I've said remind me of student films, uh, but in a good way. And this is one of them. This is a film that feels very achievable. It has a small cast, uh, but they're all delivering really great performances. Uh, Bill Skarsgård and Micah Monroe in this are are just adorable. They're they're so cute, and they have these like little ticks and like little interactions that you see in actual couples. Like, they aren't just, like, a standard movie couple. Like, they have individual things that they do and, like, phrases and ways that they interact with e each other that really reminds you of actual couples you know or people you're, that are dating that you know. Um, but at the same time, they also rob gas stations and just talk about that casually. It's, it's great. It's so <laughs> much fun. I, I laughed out loud at so many scenes in this movie. And at the same time, it's also really, really tense... At, at points there's all sorts of like oh my goodness they're on the other side of the door right now and they're trying to pick the lock and it's got great uh, kind of closed door action um the ending gets a, a little bit too serious for my liking i think since the rest of the movie is kind of a, a kind of a silly dark comedy the ending is a little too grounded and takes itself a little too seriously for me um but other than that i, I really do recommend it it's got some issues but it's a really solid script, great actors involved, uh, three out of five for me, that's, that's villains. Um, right Oh, now it is time to move on to Mitchell's Munitions Minute. This being a prison film, there are plenty of weapons throughout for Mitchell to talk about. So Mitchell, you now have a minute to talk about firearms and other weaponry in Cool Hand Luke in three, two, one, go. The man with no eyes carries a Winchester Model 70 chambered in 30-06 cartridge. Uh, it was made by Winchester for probably 50 years, and it's one of the most iconic hunting rifles of all time. It's called the, the Rifleman's Rifle, uh, as it's called. Um, the early design one that he has is based off of the uh, Carabiner 98K Mauser. Um, which is has a very similar action, so it's a gun that functions very similar to the German infantry rifles of World War II. Um, and yeah, Winchester produced these for a long time. There's a bazillion different versions of it. Um, this specific type, um, it has a controlled feed, which means that it actually grabs the uh, rounds, or it grabs the cartridges um, instead of not grabbing them, so it's a lot easier to eject. Uh, 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 cartridges and for people that were putting individual cartridges in it was a lot easier to use a rifle so it was highly desirable used for a lot of bigger game and hunting used by law enforcement and military for a really long time so All yeah right. there you go I'm kind of lengthening the minute here but I was wondering can you take the forgive my, my faux pas in terminology oh, if this isn't right <laughs> can you take yeah. the oh, bolt dear. out and just carry it around with you like that um yes you can okay I, I, I don't really know why I, I'm sure people who use bolt action rifles all the time would probably know why. Um, maybe it's because he polishes it every time or something, or does something. I know it looks really cool, but yeah. yes, you can, um, okay. especially that early variation of it. So yeah. yeah, I mean, I thought within the context of the film, it works really well because they're on a chain gang. So you know, if if one of the prisoners gets a hold of the gun, you know, you want to have oh, a part of it right. with you. Yeah, but yeah, like, yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't know if that, that was actually yeah. a thing you could do if it was just part of the script. So that's yeah. cool. I've I, I've learned something here today. All yeah. right. Uh, now, in the distance, coming closer, I hear the magical cinema tour bus uh, driven by one oh, Christian, and it's it's pulled up at the station. Uh, uh, Christian, Shh. what what are we talking about on the bus today? I am walking out of the bus. <laughs> <laughs> chick, 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 chick. 
Okay. <laughs> I rewatched Psycho, Alfred Hitchcock's horror classic starring Anthony Perkins and several others that I don't feel like naming right now. Um, amazing, amazing film. Um, the first time I saw this was, gosh, a few years ago now, which is crazy to say out loud but this is one zach showed to me and then i was i was like oh this is actually really good four out of five and that was when i was still in the uh pre-season one of cookie pocket so even worse than i sound in some of our season one episodes uh mindset of of i am here to be entertained <laughs> and even even in that um i guess i guess i'll i'll say it less mature uh approach it, i still was astonished by it and this time around i gave it a 4.5 i think the only thing that really detracts is there's kind of a big uh falling action info dump like basically mm-hmm. like an exposition dump except it's at the end of the movie um which is like managed about as well as it could be managed i guess but you know still feels like a little bit clumsy given that it follows all this perfect pacing before it um but it is I think genuinely terrifying and this movie is over 60 years old now. And it's to me much more frightening than some of the things that were made in this decade. So, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, it just all around great performances, um, deservedly iconic moments. And, uh, I would recommend it to anyone willing to watch a horror film for sure. Yeah, definitely. I, first off, uh, the magical cinema tour has been, uh, on a Japan to France route for, for quite a while, so they, they've definitely taken a detour to America this uh, yes. this, this episode. But um, I, I want to say that that ending dump by um, Professor Exposition, I, I, I'm pretty <laughs> sure that Hitchcock like really didn't want to include that, but the studio said that you had to have it because they thought audiences mm. wouldn't understand like the whole thing with Norman and Mother, uh, which is yeah. possibly true in the 60s. Um, I can't possibly say what people would have assumed at the time. Uh, but I do know that my, my grandmother often tells me that she was horrified by Psycho when she saw it and didn't want to take a shower afterward. So it's definitely an effective <laughs> yeah. movie. Um, all right, now it is time for our oldest and most reoccurring segment, The Rundown. Yes. Zach tried to escape from the box, but we, we've we caught him and we've chained him and we're we're making him dig out numbers out of our ditch in response to our terms just because and then job, putting them back in right. <laughs> he putting them back true. in and taking them out and screaming yeah. at god stuff so. yes don't don't worry zach harry dean stanton is, is strumming sadly for you in the distance but we're, we're gonna put you through this anyway all right mitchell are you ready to start us off i'm ready boss excellent three two one go your dirt in his ditch three out of five Parking meters. Four out of five. Smoking in the prone position in bed. Three out of five. The box. Four out of five. Mirror sunglasses. Three out of five. Lucille. Three out of five. Having a really cool hand. Three out of five. Nothing being a cool hand. Four out of five. A whole road of tar- tarn. Uh, four out of five. Standing in the rain talking to yourself. Uh, five out of five. Zach Garrigus is inmate number zero. Uh, four out of five. A failure to communicate. Three out of five. Sneezing dogs. Uh, four out of five. Paul Newman as Luke Jackson. Uh, four out of five. R.I.P. Dog. Four out of five. Breaking news music. Uh, four out of five. Smile, spit, or swallow. Uh, three out of five. Paul Newman smile montage. Uh, four out of five. A calm and unlikable tendency for exaggeration. Uh, four out of five. Betting he can't when he can. Uh, three out of five. Calling it a job, not making it right. Uh, four out of five. Fifty eggs in the law. Uh, four out of five. One in a box, one in a bush. Four out of five. PETA is coming for you, Zach. Uh, three out of five. <laughs> Mermaid chest tattoo. Four one second. Five. Yes. Oh, amazing. That was wow. like the best time. We got through all of them on that. Wow, yep. that's great. Um, that was solid. Okay, uh, who is... Oh, yes, Mitchell, you're hosting our next <laughs> and final episode of the season. <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> is this one of your favorite, <laughs> most emotional films, Mitchell? Is this is no. a very emotional film. Oh. So. <laughs> I, don't, I, I actually kind of don't want to watch this again. I've oh. seen it three times now. Um, oh, Hereditary, okay? This is huge brain. Uh, the, the horror fans, in, in wherever Zach goes at, uh, at night to worship the, the satanic gods <laughs> of film, um, <laughs> all talk about this movie. Um, and, 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 and it's a great cult. You should join. But um, anyway, 2018, all right? Very recent. Ari Aster. <laughs> so, 
Tony Collette, Alex Wolf, Millie Shapiro, and Gabriel Byrne all are pretty darn good, and I highly recommend you listen. Uh, definitely watch before listening and, yeah. and cry in your sleep, and actually maybe never sleep again. Um, so oh, wow. yeah. yeah, landmark film. P- people have called this the the modern equivalent of The Exorcist, and I kind of agree. It's it's really good. I'm really looking forward to talking about this. Well, oh, yeah. we've reached the end of the episode, and now we have nothing to talk about. But sometimes <laughs> nothing can be a real cool hand. Uh, thank you for joining us. And this us is when I leave. Episode Goodbye. Episode <laughs> 54 of Cookie Pocket. Uh, please tune 54. in next time for the season finale. And uh, other than that, we, we bid you adieu.